Welcome back, everybody. Um, uh, just before the next panel, um, let's hear some words from a very important player, um, the president of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Hümetli dostlarım, burada bir gerçeğin altını özellikle çizmek istiyorum. Türkiye olarak etrafımızdaki sorunlarla ilgilenirken asla irredantist yani yayılmacı, müdahaleci bir anlayış içinde değiliz. Bizim hiç kimsenin, hiçbir ülkenin toprağında, egemenliğinde, iç işlerinde gözümüz yoktur. Biz öncelikle kendi milli güvenliğimizi, kendi vatandaşlarımızın can ve mal emniyetini sağlamaya ve bunları sağlam noktada değerlendirmeye, ardından da bölgemizin ve gönül coğrafyamızın istikrar, huzur ve iç barışına katkı sunmaya çalışıyoruz. Dağlık Karabağ meselesi bu noktada önemli bir örnektir. Azerbaycan toprağı olan bu bölge, Birleşmiş Milletler, ve Agit kararlarına rağmen yaklaşık 30 yıl boyunca Ermenistan tarafından işgal edilmiş durumdaydı. Sorunu çözmek amacıyla oluşturulan MİS grubu eş başkanları ise işgali sonlandırma noktasında şimdiye kadar maalesef hiçbir adım atmamıştı. Rusya Federasyonu ile ortak çabalarımız sayesinde varılan anlaşmayla hem sıcak bir çatışmayı bitirdik, hem de 30 yıldır buzdolabında bekletilen bir sorunun çözümüne katkı sağladık. Libya'daki krizin başından beri ihtilafın sadece siyasi diyalog yoluyla çözülebileceğini savunduk. Libya Milli Mutabakat Hükümeti'ne sağladığımız eğitim ve danışmanlık desteği ülkenin daha fazla iç savaşa sürüklenmesini engelledi. Birleşmiş Milletler öncülüğündeki siyasi sürecin önünü açtı. Bugün Libya'da siyasi çözüm umutları yeniden yeşermişse bunda Türkiye'nin zamanında yaptığı müdahalenin çok ciddi katkısı bulunuyor. Sahada kalıcı ateşkesin tesisi ve kapsayıcı siyasi sürecin ilerletilmesi konusunda Birleşmiş Milletler başta olmak üzere tüm taraflarla eş güdüm halinde çabalarımızı sürdürüyoruz. Libya Siyasi diyalog formunun çalışmalarını da destekliyoruz. Doğu Akdeniz'deki her türlü gelişmenin yükünü taşıyan ülkemizin doğal kaynaklar söz konusu olduğunda yok sayılmasına elbette rıza gösteremezdik. Yunanistan ve Güney Kıbrıs Rum yönetiminin provokasyonlarına rağmen Doğu Akdeniz meselesinde daima sabırlı, soğukkanlı davrandık. Avrupa Birliği'nin Birlik içi dayanışma adı altında Doğu Akdeniz'de kendi haklarımızı hem de Kıbrıs Türklerinin menfaatlerini korumak için kararlılıkla yürüttüğümüz arama ve sondaj faaliyetlerine dair ithamları tarihle, hukukla, gerçeklerle bağdaşmıyor. Kıbrıs Türklerine yönelik izolasyonlara son verilmesi ve Doğu Akdeniz'deki hidrokarbon kaynaklarının hakkaniyetli paylaşımı yönündeki çabalarımızı aynı kararlılıkla sürdüreceğiz. Diğer taraftan diyalog ve diplomasiye kapımızı hiçbir zaman kapatmadık, kapatmıyoruz. Kıbrıs Türklerinin de katılacağı bir Doğu Akdeniz Konferansı düzenlenmesi önerimiz, sorunu diyalogla çözme irademizin tezahürüdür. Türkiye, Ege'de ve Doğu Akdeniz'de mevcut sorunların aşılması için her zaman yapıcı tutum sergilemiştir. Nitekim geçtiğimiz aylarda NATO Genel Sekreterinin girişimiyle ülkemiz ile Yunanistan arasında NATO çatısı altında gerçekleştirilen ayrıştırma görüşmelerine başından itibaren aktif ve samimi biçimde katılım gösterdik, katkı sağladık. Ayrıca Yunanistan ile Ege sorunlarının ele alındığı ve sonuncusu dört buçuk yıl önce gerçekleştirilen istikşafi görüşmeler sürecinin yeniden başlatılması hususunda mutabakata vardık.
conflict between Turkey and Greece in the eastern Mediterranean. For weeks now, the two countries have been disputing maritime boundaries and offshore energy rights. On Tuesday, they sent warships to the waters in a show of force. Hello again, I'm Robin Shepard, Vice President of Halifax International Security Forum. Uh, and welcome to this panel, uh, which is called Clubs Med, The Scramble for Middle Earth. Uh, a terrific uh, video, uh, as always, from uh, Steve Markle. Um, watching it, you, you kind of want to, to be in the Mediterranean. Um, the problem is, is that it is a problematic part of the world, and I don't think that many people outside of the Mediterranean region uh, have really got a full handle on what's going on. Uh, and I, I, I, my intention is, is to get back to basics in this discussion, uh, so that by the end of it, those who are not experts uh, in this subject uh, do have a sense uh, of what's going on and uh, what's at stake. Uh, I'd like to introduce our panel. Uh, first of all, um, Sipi Livni, uh, the former Minister of Justice and former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Israel, and she's coming to us uh, from Israel today. Um, welcome back, uh, Ms. Livni. It's always uh, terrific to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, also, uh, Véronique uh, Roger Lacan is the Ambassador of France to UNESCO, and she's joining us from France this morning. Welcome to you. Good morning, and good evening to those uh, in Europe. <laughs> Good morning to all. Good morning here from uh, from Washington DC as well. And uh, Sassos Khatsivasileu, uh, if I pronounced that correctly, uh, is a member of the Greek Parliament and the Secretary General of the Standing Committee on National Defense and Foreign Affairs uh, in Greece. And he's dialing in from Greece. Good afternoon from Athens. And yes, you spelled it right. It's difficult, but it was awesome from your side. Well, thank you. I'm not, I'm not known for my uh, ability to pronounce Greek uh, very well, um, and I'm pleased I, uh, I didn't say something outright rude. It's always difficult when you're pronouncing foreign languages. I speak a few foreign languages, and I know the pitfalls. Uh, so uh, I'm delighted that I didn't uh, completely make a, a mess of that. Um, this is a very difficult subject. And, and you know, if you're not one of these people that spends every day reading every line of the Financial Times uh, or, or uh, going through academic texts or actually living and breathing it as, as you do, um, it's not easy to get a handle on what is going on, partly because there are so many different things going on uh, at once. Um, I wanted to start with you, Ms. Livni, um, from Israel. I mean, Israel uh, is, is, exists in, in what in itself is a very difficult uh, and very tough neighborhood. Um, there has been some some progress, it seems, uh, yes. in in recent months, and and uh, you know, on a very in a very bleak environment, it, it's nice to be able to say that some progress has happened. I wonder if you could just give a sense, and as I say, try and get people to back to basics. Is that why is it significant uh, that uh, uh, Arab countries are starting to recognise Israel? Well, basically, it's a huge change and the beginning of a new Middle East, in a way. Uh, because for many years, uh, Arab world and uh, Islamic or Muslim states were not willing to recognize the right of Israel to exist, basically because of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And in 2002, the Arab League said that normalization with Israel is linked to a peace between Israel and the Palestinians. And then... Uh, in a few months, uh, Gulf states, uh, the Emirates, Bahrain, uh, also Sudan, and it looks like the beginning of a trend of normalizing the relations with Israel. And this is very good news. Uh, the unfortunate situation is that we still ha have an open conflict with the Palestinians. And I believe that it is an Israeli interest as well to solve this conflict without any connection or without linking this to the normalization that we have with uh, other Arab and Muslim states. But yet, uh, since uh, we saw uh, Erdogan at the beginning of this session, there are those in the region that are not accepting uh, or, or this uh, normalization with Israel uh, or do not embrace this, but criticize it. 
uh, not, uh, not because of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but because Erdogan, I think, uh, is connected mostly, uh, mostly to the Muslim Brotherhood, to Hamas, which is a terrorist organization within uh, the Palestinian territory. And in a way, uh, while there are very good news, and this is normalization with Israel, talking about the Mediterranean for the first time, Israel is now negotiating with Lebanon, uh, the maritime uh, border that will uh, affect the possibility of Lebanon also uh, to use uh, the, the natural uh, resources that we have in the Mediterranean and other countries like Israel, Cyprus, Greece, uh, want also to uh, cooperate on, on, on all these uh, gas and uh, natural resources that we have in the Mediterranean. So this is the good news. The other part goes to Syria, in which we have a uh, completely um, situation which is not stabilized yet. Uh, Turkey involved in some parts of Syria, Iran involved in other parts of Syria, continuing in supporting Hezbollah, which is a terrorist organization within Lebanon. So I believe just to, to close this, that while there are good news in terms of understanding that the threat comes from Iran, we see new uh, alliances in the region, we see Turkey, Iran, uh, and the role of the new administration of the United States is crucial because Erdogan had uh, uh, the relations between Trump and Erdogan are one thing, and um, the position and the policy of the new administration uh, toward Iran, Turkey, uh, I, I think that it would be uh, different. Um, uh, Mr. Khasi Vasileu, um, we've just got an indication from uh, from Ms. Livni as to how many moving parts there are, and that's only it's only a, a few of those moving parts have been have been mentioned, and we're certainly going to come back uh, to a number of those issues. I, I mean, there has been some progress um, in, in terms of, of regional peace uh, with Israel and, and a number of states recognizing Israel. Uh, unfortunately, this year, in, in terms of relations between Greece and Turkey. Uh, you know, there's been a kind of regress. Uh, uh, thankfully, it seems to be held in check somewhat. I mean, we just heard uh, from the uh, president of Turkey, uh, uh, Mr. Erdogan, and, uh, you know, it seemed to be a combination of, of really standing up uh, and, and, and pushing quite an assertive line, but also uh, aligning himself with the United Nations, uh, aligning himself with, with NATO, uh, and, and, and thanking, actually, uh, the Secretary General of NATO for, uh, for, for brokering and, and, and trying to mollify some of the problems with Greece. From your point of view, from Greece's point of view, where do we stand right now in this fast-moving uh, situation with Turkey? First of all, I listened to Mr. Erdogan a couple of minutes ago. He rejected the redentism, but he occupies 37% of the Cypriot territory. And uh, there is a constant threat of war against Greece, a casus belli, in case that uh, the Greek side decides to expand its territorial waters up to 12 miles, uh, as indicated uh, by the international law. Uh, the problem is that, you know, Turkey is a common denominator of instability in the Middle Earth as we call it, region. It violates the rational law and holds military occupation, uh, operations in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, even now in Nagorno-Karabakh. So we see that President Erdogan uh, has increased Turkey's military footprint around the neighborhood, and he tries to uh, present his uh, revisionist dream, his neo-Ottomanist dream about making Turkey uh, the strongest uh, power in the region and one of the superpowers in, in terms of uh, global balance of powers. The problem is that Greece is uh, a factor of stability and a factor of cooperation in the region. We call Turkey several times to come and resume the exploratory talks that were stopped in 2016 with the decision of Turkey at that time. You know that Turkey has agreed three times this year to resume these talks but they never did so. Instead of that, uh, they uh, tried to send thousands of immigrants and refugees in the Greek-Turkish border of Evros last March. And as you all remember the images, 
the Greek side uh, defended uh, the territory and uh, our sovereignty. May and number two, mm -hmm. they operate some illegal researchers uh, on the continental shelf of Greece in the Mediterranean with the vessel of Oruç Reis. What does it mean that Turkey violates the national law and that Turkey is not ready to sit on the same table with Greece to discuss our sole difference, which is the limitation of the continental shelf and the exclusive economic zone. We are ready, but we can do that only if all the vessels and the legal researchers are leaving and are stopping what are they doing in the Mediterranean over the Greek shelf. This is the only precondition we set in order to resume our talks. I mean, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Erdogan said, he said in these recent remarks, and he said before, and you, you in fact uh, conceded, that uh, Turkey has, has never closed the door to diplomacy. This is what he says. I wonder whether, I mean, look, let's face it, there are historic problems and difficulties in the Greek-Turkish relationship, which you will know uh, from your perspective in intimate detail, as the Turkish side knows in intimate detail, mm -hmm. to actually smooth this over. Is there any sense in which President-elect Biden can be, as it were, the responsible adult in the room? And that he can... Uh, you have your complaints, the Turkish side has its complaints. Uh, at the end of the day, the last thing anybody wants is for this to, to move in the direction which it looked as though it could have done at some point earlier this year, into military confrontation. Are you hopeful that President-elect Biden can play a role in, in, in calming the situation down and finding a mutually acceptable agreement? First of all, uh, we know that President Erdogan had a specific bond with uh, President Trump. And uh, it seems that uh, uh, now that uh, Mr. Trump is going to leave the White House on January, Erdogan will lose his direct link with the Oval Office allow me to say. So yes, I believe that the new administration under Mr. Biden uh, will be, let's say, uh, will have a fruitful um, assistance to our bilateral problems because Mr. Biden knows where Mediterranean is. He knows what Cyprus problem is. He knows what's going on in the Middle Eastern zone. So he knows all our neighborhood. Uh, this is why we are really optimistic that Mr. Biden will uh, help uh, Turkey to come back to the Western, let's say, uh, group of powers, because every day we see that Ankara uh, lives miles away from our common Western values, even the values of NATO, uh, who uh, is a full member, as you know. I wanted to turn to you, um, uh, Ambassador Roger Lecan. Um, how did we get to such a state of affairs that France and Turkey, both members of NATO, are, seem to be on opposite sides of the, a very complicated situation in Libya. Uh, and, uh, uh, look, I mean, Turkey is actually following in, in the footsteps, certainly what the Turkish side would say, of the United Nations. I mean, this is, you know, it, how did we get to a state of affairs where two NATO members are at loggerheads about a very complicated situation, which is quite a long way from, from their own territory? Thank you. Good evening. Um, maybe it's because uh, member states of the international community nowadays forget about what multilateralism is, forget that uh, they have signed uh, multilateral and universal uh, charters. You are talking about uh, NATO, but I'm an ambassador to UNESCO, so I will refer to texts in the UN system and in the UN. Member states signed the 1945 uh, UN Charter, 1945 UNESCO Constitutive Act, uh, the 1966 uh, International Convenance on uh, Individual Rights, Civil and Political and Economic and Social Rights. It means that member states each have, be before uh, going to such types of uh, geopolitical hurdle, they have a responsibility to look after the individual rights to uh, freedom, to civil and political rights of their individual citizens. And once they may look at that and may go back to those texts and may go back to multilateralism, um, there might be a chance to, uh, to, to, to avoid this type of behavior. This is a problem nowadays. Uh, member states of the international community are going away from the sex and we see what happens. So it's a strong call to multilateralism that I want to make. 
um, just because the responsibility of uh, member states is to look at the well-being of their individual citizens. Uh, if they would do that, maybe there would be less uh, conflicts. I would, and then maybe, maybe some member states would say, okay, but I do what I want. I have my national law. I don't care about international law. I don't care about multilateralism. All right, that means that maybe there is a lack of an international cop or an international judge, um, but then who is going to be that international cop or this international judge? This is again a call for multilateralism because of course we don't want, and this is the fight that you mentioned, is a fight for leadership on the in on the international scene and uh, uh, our colleague in this panel member of the greek parliament was mentioning that that there is a race uh, for uh, for influence and power in the planet but of course um, citizens don't want that they don't want to be run either by turkey or by china or by the us they want to be run by uh, a community that looks after their own rights. And I would like to conclude on that point to refer to the European Union, because we see that the main example of success in this regard of multilateralism, looking at the well being of individuals, is the European Union. And this is also precisely why, because it is a success, because it is stability. And because it shows that you don't need to dominate some parts of the world, you just need to cooperate. And this is why there are a lot of um, uh, states in the international community that want to undermine this success. And of course, it's a problem. And I want to conclude that point by saying that against this type of uh, influence and, and, and, and willingness to, um, to uh, uh, damage the success of the EU, the EU is still continuing to um, uh, provide, to extend cooperation and help. EU, the, the 28 uh, EU member states and the EU is the number one donor in the international community. It extends uh, 50 billion uh, euros per year just to promote the well-being of citizens, the human rights of the international citizens, the fundamental rights of, uh, of uh, international citizens. This is what we have to look at. Before we come back into some of the details, and you know, there is a line that you know, if you want to understand something, follow the money, and we'll get into the question of gas and natural resources um, shortly. But Mrs. Libney, I wanted to come back to you um, uh, on this question that uh, that Ambassador um, Roger Lecan uh, raised about essentially global governance, and the president-elect uh, appears to be made of the kind of stuff which is a little bit different from uh, President uh, President. Trumps in terms of, of managing international relations. Um, first of all, in regard to Israel, I mean, President Trump, uh, I, I suspect, is pretty popular in Israel, or certainly in, in some quarters in Israel. I mean, he moved the uh, the, the embassy from Tel Aviv to uh, to Jerusalem. I mean, it was always something of a fiction uh, that uh, that you know, the capital of Israel is in fact in Tel Aviv when it obviously is in Jerusalem. But uh, you know, this. How do you do? You believe that uh, President Biden is going to uh, affect the situation in the Middle East vis-a-vis -vis Israel in particular? Uh, well, it is true that President Trump uh, supported the Israeli interest and made the change, uh, moving the embassy to Jerusalem, Abraham Accords and uh, peace and normalization between Israel and the uh, Gulf states and Arab Muslim states, uh, recognizing also uh, Israel's sovereignty on Golan Heights. Uh, all these uh, really represent the Israeli interest, but Israel is part of the international community. And as was said before, I believe that Israel uh, is not only part of the international community, but represent or should represent the values that, uh, in a way, were eroded in uh, the term of uh, President uh, Trump. And when the third president of the United States the most important democracy in the world is crossing red lines, not only in terms of, in terms of uh, the meaning and the values of democracy, in terms of multilateralism and the way he acts with the, with the other parts of the world. So I believe that President-elect Biden, assuming that he 
uh, supports uh, the idea of normalization, but yet also hopefully would succeed in relaunching also negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians in an understanding that peace between Israel and Palestinians is also important, something and would take off the table the idea of annexation that for a while President Trump supported. So shortly, it is true and uh, we appreciate uh, the support of the Israeli interests, but as a citizen of the world, as uh, uh, believing in democracy, and the values of democracy and the need of Israel to be part of the international community, I must say that I, um, um, in, in, in a way, waiting for, for President-elect Biden to represent all this also in his relations with Israel. And the challenge is, and just one thing to say also about <clears throat> Erdogan, the challenge is Iran. Uh, President Trump, uh, was willing to negotiate Iran. We need to, to remember this as well. And this is something that uh, President Biden, President-elect Biden need also to, to address. And my advice would be to address this uh, issue after having a conversation, a dialogue with Israel and with Gulf states uh, in order to understand the nature of the threat that Iran is posing and to give an answer accordingly. And another thing about Erdogan, which is clear that, you know, NATO was established after the Second World War as part of the world uh, order in an understanding, what does it mean, the uh, transatlantic uh, cooperation and alliance. And I think that Erdogan doesn't really see himself or the way he, he what he's doing also internally and his uh, ex, um, also foreign policy is based on completely different understandings. So he's part of NATO, but I don't think that he represents the interest of NATO as a group these days. And therefore, this also uh, creates um, a new, it's not new, but uh, a problem that needs to be addressed. I just wanted to pick up on one thing very quickly, just uh, if you, it's very hard to answer anything in 15 seconds about Israel, but um, it, it, do you have the slightest fear that President-elect Biden will move the embassy back from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv? No, he, uh, I think that uh, what was, President-elect Biden, is not going to rewind the clock mm -hmm. or uh, go back to, to the place in which we were in the past. So therefore, the embassy would remain, I believe, in Jerusalem. And I hope that he would also support more normalization or more Arab states to normalize their relations with Israel to address the Iranian threat, but also simultaneously he represents something that I believe is important to the entire international community. And this is multilateralism and also representing uh, the values of democracy, as I believe, uh, also should be in Israel and other parts of the world. Uh, Mr. Uh, Khasi Vasileu, um, uh, let's come back on, a, on another thread. Again, as I say, it's very multi-layered and lots of moving parts. Um, let's go back to energy. I mean, uh, you're from Greece. We have, we have Greece, France and Israel represented uh, on this panel today. And we heard from uh, uh, Mr. Erdogan representing Turkey. Um, it isn't necessarily obvious, intuitively obvious, um, why your countries are interconnected in quite the way they are unless you start looking at energy. And, and the gas reserves uh, pr uh, open up the promise of, of enormous wealth uh, for all of the countries involved. Um, starting with the question with Turkey, I mean, you know, if you look at the map, which is obviously a good place to start, and you see the Turkish coast and you see mainland Greece is quite away from it, but um, the, the, these small islands... Um, including roads, which I've been to, and you see the mountains uh, immediately in front of you in, in Turkey. I mean, because of the historic, um, the, the, the way that, that Greece became independent and the way that uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire um, uh, became uh, modern Turkey, I mean, it, it is difficult to find in international law a way of accommodating 
a history like that and making it fair to both sides, isn't it? Wouldn't you agree that it isn't actually completely clear cut who's got the rights to this gas and you're just going to have to negotiate and reach a compromise? You know, I'm an old friend of Turkey and they've been living in Istanbul for several months uh, during my studies period, but you know, uh, there is a difference here. Uh, we need to delimitate the continental shelf and the exclusive economic zones between Greece and Turkey. The only way to do it is to follow what the international law and the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Seas are saying. So this is the only path to find uh, a mutual compromise. Unfortunately, Turkey does not accept what international law says. You mentioned energy. Yes, the region here is, uh, is very important to uh, all the parts of the world. Why? Because now we have huge energy resources. And this is why Greece and other states of the region uh, participate in specific cooperation schemes, multilateral schemes, like for example, Greece, Cyprus and Israel, or Greece, Cyprus, Egypt, or with the United Arab Emirates. Uh, therefore, we are open to cooperate with any band in the region in order to uh, earn money from these resources and to work, for example, about the East Med uh, plan, you know, this important pipeline uh, that is uh, really a priority for the Europe as a whole. Unfortunately, Turkey excludes herself from all these cooperation projects, from all these schemes. Why? Because her provocative and revisionist agenda is incompatible with the notion of cooperation in energy factor, in, energy, in the energy field, we say. So, to sum up, yes, Greece, we believe that energy sector is something that can connect all the states of the region, but on the grounds that everybody will accept international law and will accept uh, the delimitation of our maritime zones. Otherwise, we cannot find a common ground to work together, to cooperate together, to earn together. Ambassador Roger Lecan, it's, it's um, easy to criticise um, Turkey and, and, you know, one could say that there are good reasons to criticise Turkey as there are many other countries in the region. The European Union, and I know you're not a spokesperson for the European Union, but you, you, you work in an international institution. And as you said in, in response to the previous question, you understand the, the, the fundamental importance of international institutions. I mean, the reality is the EU closed its door to Turkey after essentially holding it half open open for, for decades. It isn't altogether surprising that with that door shut, Turkey then pursued its own path, is it? Well, <laughs> I will go back then to, uh, to, to what I just said before. It didn't, the EU did not close its door uh, to anyone. It doesn't close its door to anyone. The EU has a criteria that all EU member states respect, follow, have a uh, have elaborated together and uh, are implementing together. So anyone, any country which want to join the EU has at the outset to demonstrate uh, throughout uh, life, individual lives and, and, and uh, the time that it respects those, uh, those texts, the, you know, the, the, the treaties that uh, are funded, as I said before, on the rights of individuals to security, stability, but also to the enjoyment of their individual rights to freedom uh, and to their human rights. This is the criteria. Then there are many uh, other countries who have been uh, knocking at the door of the EU. The process is cumbersome, is very long, but there is progress. So the door is not closed. Uh, they I, are I have to say, I think that the, Turk, the Turks would find it uh, a little rich to hear that the door isn't closed to them. I mean, a number of EU states have made it quite clear that they would just veto it if, it, if, if Turkey was to be invited, isn't it? Isn't that well, the no, it's that you just have, as I said, you just have a set of criteria, a set of uh, items that you have to follow. But I wanted to also to go back to, uh, because you are... Uh, we are dealing with the Mediterranean and to come back to UNESCO. Mm. Um, and there is a case in point in UNESCO on uh, issues of uh, uh, pertaining to the Mediterranean, the case of Hagia Sophia and Chora. Um, you know that this is, these two items are a part of the uh, 
uh, a whole uh, system which was called uh, uh, the, the historic areas of Istanbul that have been recognized or listed on the World Heritage List in 1985. And uh, you, everybody has heard or has read in the press the whole issue of uh, Hagia Sophia and Hora being transformed from museums, secular museums, into mosques. And this is where multilateralism is very interesting because we have a convention, the 1972 Convention on the Protection of uh, Cultural, human, um, Universal Cultural and Natural Heritage. And this is with, it is with this convention that we are going to try to sort out this discussion is the fact that Hagia Sophia has been transformed into a mosque, a criteria for delisting it, uh, transforming it into something else than world heritage, or is it not? It's a discussion that is very uh, difficult because it has huge uh, implications and huge uh, background, historical background, but it is also a case for multilateralism because there are texts that we can discuss. Also, what is at stake is to, to see whether the, the, the, the, the, the, not the material, but the, the building has uh, under, undergone some damages because of its transformation into a mosque. We will have to discuss that. Experts are going there. Um, we might also, we ambassadors of uh, UNESCO, be interested in, in going to visit that, to see it by ourselves, but we have to assess uh, this whole thing. Um, uh, Sipi Livni, just coming back to this question of, of Israel and international institutions, I mean, there's been, uh, and I was talking about Turkey and the EU, and it's not an easy question to answer. Um, uh, nothing's ever easy to answer in relation to Israel and international institutions, partly because there's a lot of rejectionism out there. Um, the, the European Union, is, the, is there even in some real world future a place for Israel inside the e European Union or NATO? I think that uh, in the past there were some uh, discussions about it and Israel, but not about Israel really joining the EU, but it is mostly about having a special uh, status uh, in its relations, in our relations with the EU. Not being part, not being a member state, but uh, having special relations with, and uh, I think that uh, for now it works for both sides. You could end up being like Britain without having actually joined and then left, you just get the same sort of relation. But actually, in all seriousness, some kind of relationship like uh, uh, countries which are close enough to the EU to have a real relationship, but, but are not actually full members, something like that is, is potentially on the cards in the future. Um, uh, let me turn back to, to the question of, uh, <clears throat> uh, of, of Greece and uh, uh, the, the um, energy question. Um, it, Greece, obviously, since 2008, um, suffered terribly in the Great Recession. Um, you're bound to have been hit very hard uh, by uh, COVID-19 in that the Greek economy, a significant part of the Greek economy, is uh, uh, dependent on, on tourism. I mean, how... I mean, people can often forget just how significant the economic consequences um, in the Mediterranean, um, as elsewhere, are of COVID-19. How hard are you being hit? Yes, it's really a difficult situation. It's really difficult here in Greece. You know that uh, last year we had something like 31 million of tourists in our country. Uh, but unfortunately, this year we couldn't have the same numbers. The reasons are obvious. Uh, the good thing is that in terms of the pandemic, the Greek government uh, has shown an unprecedented readiness to deal with uh, the current crisis. Uh, if you follow the numbers, you can see that uh, the Greek statistics in terms of the pandemic are among uh, the best ones uh, across Europe, uh, even not only Europe, but uh, in the national scene. Uh, we're confident that uh, we can stand up again on our legs. Uh, you know that we have uh, a huge plan uh, of supporting uh, the domestic uh, entrepreneurs and uh, you know all the companies that are existing here in our country. 
And uh, also uh, Greece uh, was among the first countries that presented the draft uh, plan for, to the European Union in order to take money from uh, the recovery fund, uh, the special fund that uh, was designed for the pandemic uh, starting from January 2021. So yes, we are ready. We have a specific plan that we have presented to our European partners. And uh, we believe that uh, next year, Greece uh, will come back. Um, Ambassador Roger Lecan, um, final words from you before I go to final words from uh, from Sipi Livni. Um, the, the, the, the implications of COVID-19 are, are, are very deep and very widespread uh, and can be often very unexpected. I mean, people are just not visiting the UNESCO sites very often because they can't travel. Uh, is, what impact is COVID having, having on you guys at UNESCO? Well, the impact is huge because, you know, UNESCO is the United uh, uh, Nations Organization for Education, Science and Culture. So education has been at the heart of our preoccupations. 99% of students and pupils have been out of school uh, during the first uh, confinement. And we have uh, been uh, working and, and fighting to invent new ways of teaching and of learning. It's very difficult because uh, spontaneously everyone went uh, online, on internet, but not everyone, not every child, not every family has internet. So we have uh, had to invent uh, other forms of diffusion of education. We've worked with t TV networks, radio networks, and we are still uh, working on that. Um, in Africa, for example, in some countries, in uh, Congo and Democratic uh, Republic of, uh, of Congo, kids went back to school only in September. And there, uh, in, the, in the meantime, we worked a lot on how to provide education to them. Also culture for artists, for the whole cultural industry. It's a huge impact. Um, in France here, we have lots of artists, of, uh, uh, of, cine, of cinema, movie uh, directors, uh, theater directors, uh, painters, and everywhere in the world. But UNESCO has been able, through multilateralism again, with lots of means that member states have wanted to, to share, to connect uh, with all those uh, artists. And in fact, it has provided something new because artists which before did not connect, now connect on the internet. But we hope that this, <laughs> this crisis will, uh, will really be resolved. And it's also something that uh, we, we, now we, are, we have been all fighting to fight this uh, virus. But at the outset, we would have hoped that uh, the one uh, um, state of the international community that underwent that first, would not send all its ill people outside of its country and throughout the world to spread the virus there. Sibu Livni, how has Israel been uh, been faring? It's uh, uh, one sees has been a resurgence. You have a very advanced uh, medical sector. I mean, what, what's what's going on in the Israeli um, high tech yeah. medical sector? Yeah. Well, we we had at the beginning uh, the reaction was very quick. Uh, entering to a lockdown, and uh, it looks like, okay, we are over, and then we went out of this lockdown and faced a second wave of uh, COVID. And uh, now, like the entire world, we are waiting for uh, the vaccine, but uh, yet the numbers are reducing, and it's now what we, uh, what we are facing is that there are communities in which the numbers are quite... Uh, uh, problematic, and in other communities, the numbers are reducing. So altogether, I think that the right thing to do within Israel is to work specifically in communities and towns in which the numbers are in the, what we call the red places, while more open the uh, economy in green places. But I do believe that globally, and this is not connected only to Israel, the day after COVID, hopefully they would you know, give the vaccine to, to the entire world the soonest, the better. But yet I believe that the gaps between uh, countries would be uh, broader. Uh, and it's a huge question how international organization 
will uh, deal with uh, the day after. And I think that this is time to have this discussion about the day after with different parts and of the international community and the international organizations. Thank you, and thank you to all three of you. I think as, as anybody who watched this will realize there are many different things going on at once, and, and I really want to thank uh, Tsipi Livni, uh, Veronique roger lecan and uh, Tassos uh, Hatsi Vasileu uh, for a really informative conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, our next panel uh, will be Go Canada, Middle Powers Show the Way, featuring the Honourable Harjit Sajjan, Canada's Minister of National Defence. Um, uh, and uh, before we get there, HFX would like to take a moment to recognise and thank uh, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Germany for uh, sponsoring and supporting uh, that panel. But just before we get there, as many of you know, one of the most impactful programmes at HFX, and something I'm very proud of personally, is the Peace with Women Fellowship. And while we can't be together for obvious reasons uh, to meet the fellows uh, this year, we wanted to take a moment to recognize the class of 2020. I think generally in our society, change is incremental, and real change, enduring change, happens one step at a time. In my lifetime, I expect to see three for perhaps even more women on the high court bench, women not shaped from the same mold, but of different complexions. I surely would not be in this room today without the determined efforts of men and women who kept dreams of equal citizenship alive. women or other minorities can be added value. We can be the positive disruptors if we have the courage to be. So pressure was high to succeed and the news was all over it. A woman, can she do it? Women in security should not be the exception. They should be the norm. The Peace with Women Fellowship is a three-week program for senior female military officers from NATO member and partner countries that expands the knowledge and networks of participants to widen and deepen their capacity for effective leadership. Beyond the extensive knowledge that our participants gain through more than 50 high-level discussions and briefings through the program, the relationships that alumni build with our hosts and with each other are invaluable. Hello, I'm Colonel Kate Barber commander of the Air Force Technical Application Center on Florida's Space Coast at Patrick Air Force Base. And I am a Peace With Women Fellow. I am Colonel Rihanna Irish from the Royal Netherlands Army, and I am a Peace With Women Fellow. I am Colonel Melissa Emmett from the British Army, and I am a Peace With Women Fellow. My name is Group Captain Carol Abraham from the New Zealand Defence Force, and I'm a Peace With Women Fellow. My name is Colonel Ivana Kocelik from the Ministry of Defence of the Slovak Republic, and I'm a Peace With Women Fellow. My name is... Colonel Dr. Stephanie Krause from the Joint Medical Service of the German Armed Forces, and I am a Peace with Women Fellow. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Lena Lillelund from the Danish Armed Forces, and I am a Peace with Women Fellow. My name is Kenna Valérie Morcel from the French Armed Forces, and I am Peace with Women Fellow. My name is Captain Rebecca Orr with the United States Coast Guard, and I am a Peace with Women Fellow. My name is Major General Sherman Sewe from the Swiss Armed Forces, and I am a Peace With Women Fellow. G'day, my name is Colonel Rebecca Talbot from the Australian Defence Force, and I am a Peace With Women Fellow. My name is Colonel Geneviève Lehou from the Canadian Armed Forces, and I am a Peace With Women Fellow. My most important role is not as minister, it's actually as a father, father to my 11-year-old daughter, father to my eight-year-old son. All of us must look at our decisions and make sure that we are supporting a more inclusive, inclusive space. We need to call upon the champions among us who sit in positions of influence to tip the scale. In just three years, we have doubled the number of participating countries and seen a 270% increase in applications. This tells us that the Peace With Women Fellowship is needed and that it is valued.
I am honored to be a part of this tremendous group of incredible leaders and look forward to meeting all of you in person in April 2021.